Hi there. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Programming the Web with Native Code. I'm Ian Lewis. This is David Springer. Oh. Just to give you an idea of our backgrounds, uh, I spent several years working at Microsoft. Uh, Dave spent several years working at Apple. And we're coming together at Google to make the world a better place. Before we begin, we want to remind you that you can follow along on Wave if you'd like to be sitting there typing instead of listening. That's fine. Uh, this URL is what you need to go to. So are we going, what are we going to talk about today? Well, first we're going to start with an overview of Native Client, what it is, and why is it cool. Then we're going to talk about our new Native Client SDK, which make it easier to develop uh, applications for Native Client. And to show you how to use the SDK, Dave's put together a tutorial. Uh, he'll build a simple app using native client and JavaScript and web technologies. And then finally, we're going to show you a little bit about what's in the pipeline for the native client team. Now, there's a few things that we're not going to talk about today. We're not going to talk about the nitty gritty internals of our security model or our, our runtime system. <clears throat> um, we, we talked about that last year, and to be honest, it hasn't really changed all that much. What's new this year is that we now have an implementation that you can actually use to write real-world applications. So this year, what we'd like to do is focus a little bit more on the developer story, although if you do have questions about our security model or you want to shoot holes in it, we'd love you to, and we'll give you some uh, URLs to go to at the end of the presentation. Now, before we get too far into this, there's one thing that we do need to get out of the way. You know, we're developers, and developers like short identifiers. So even though the project name is Native Client, uh, we're going to shorten that to NACL. We pronounce it NACL. It's a source of all sorts of sodium chloride-related puns. When you hear us say NACL, that's what we're talking about. So what is NACL, and why should you care? Well, NACL is two things. First, it's a portable system for verifying and executing untrusted code, native code, inside the browser. So there's some terms there that can be a little bit confusing, so let's define those before we go any further. When we say native code, we're talking about the actual machine language of the CPU that your client is running. So just raw machine, machine code bytes. Untrusted is a word that has specific meaning to security geeks. Uh, even to, to the layman, I, I think it sounds a little bit scary. But in this context, what it means is code that you don't have to trust because you haven't given it any privileges. Now, of course, when you put together untrusted code and native code, things can get a little scary because there's all sorts of tricks that you can use in native code to get privileges even though you haven't been given them, right? So that's where verification comes in. When we say verify, what we mean is we disassemble the code and run it through a special algorithm that's going to prove whether or not the code has the ability to exit its sandbox. And if it has any possibility of exiting the sandbox, we don't run it. That's our security model. Now, to understand why this is interesting, think about the two ways that are most popular for running code in the browser today. You can write code in JavaScript, which is portable, and it's safe, and it's awesome, and you're going to hear a lot about it at this conference. But you do give up a little performance when you do that. Well, if you want that performance, you can write in, in a compiled language, like C or C++. You generate uh, you know, an NPI plugin or an ActiveX plugin. Uh, That'll give you your performance, but say goodbye to safety and portability. The goal of Native Client is to give you both the safety of JavaScript with the performance of C++. And we feel like we've gotten pretty close. Native Client is also a runtime sandbox. So I like to think of this as a, as a sort of mini OS inside your browser. And it's got all the things that a normal OS has, except they're all webified. So <clears throat> it's got a POSIX API. It's got a kernel, which is basically Chrome. It's got a Windows Manager, which is HTML5. And it's got a multimedia layer, and that's something called Pepper that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. 
because we're running in this virtual mini OS, the code that you write in NACL is 100% portable across Mac and Windows and Linux. You don't have to rewrite it. You don't even have to recompile it in most cases. But what can you do with something like this? Well, let's say you've got a desktop application and you want to port it to the web. If you recompile your code for inside a native client, <clears throat> you lose the install and you get all the performance that you're used to getting on the desktop. Or maybe you've got a web app already and you just want to turbocharge it a bit. This actually happened to a team we've got in Boulder that's making a, sort of a sketch up for the web type of application. And they wanted to use this gargantuan computational geometry library called Seagal. It's a huge, huge library. It's taken, you know, man centuries to write. And there's no way you're going to port that to JavaScript. There's no way that you're going to get equivalent functionality in JavaScript. But by recompiling it for native client, we were able to hook to that from JavaScript and keep the same performance and functionality that we had in C. So if you've got functionality that's been compiled in C already, you can use that in your web applications. And another way that you might use native client is if you've already got a plugin, but you'd like to move from the sort of unsafe, insecure model of raw C and C++, ActiveX, uh, MP API, what have you, into a more safe sandboxed model. So native client allows you to just recompile that plugin, run it inside of our sandbox, and you get all of the uh, safety of native client without having to give up the power of native plugins. So at this point, you're probably thinking, wow, that's great. What's the catch, right? There are some pain points. Now, the first pain point is that in order for us to verify the code, you need to compile code that is verifiable. That's not too difficult. What it means is it has to follow a certain set of rules that make it reliably disassemblable. We need to be able to, to reliably disassemble your code. That means that it's going to be slightly larger and in many cases run slightly slower. But the performance difference is very minor. Now, another thing that is, is less than optimal is that you don't get all of your Unix syscalls. But on the other hand, they're sort of the same syscalls that you wouldn't expect to get in a sandboxed environment anyway. So you don't get to play with the user's file system directly. You don't get to create sockets or processes willy-nilly. But you can create threads, you can create web sockets, and you can talk to your server the same way JavaScript can. Finally, although we've been putting a lot of work into our SDK, there are still a bunch of rough edges that we're polishing off. I wouldn't expect it to run perfectly right out of the box for every case right now, but uh, as Dave will show you, it's, uh, it's actually quite easy to use, and we're working on making it easier. So to recap, how does native client make your life better? Well, first, it gives you the performance of native compiled code. It gives you a platform-independent multimedia layer it gives you the ability to write in your choice of language because we look at machine code, not interpreted code like JavaScript. It gives you the ability to do things like create threads and talk to web sockets. And finally, and best of all, from my point of view, you're never gonna see this dialogue again. This is sort of my, my artist's impression of the dialogue that you'd see on, you know, let's say a certain operating system if you're going to install, let's say, an NP API plugin. And I've always felt, I don't know how you feel, but I've always felt like this dialogue is making me uh, make an impossible choice, right? I might trust your company, or at least I, I might trust your company not to be evil, right? But I don't trust that you not to make a mistake. I don't trust you to not have a bug that turns into a huge security flaw. So how can I really say yes or no to this dialogue, right? Native client is the end of the do you trust this publisher dialogue. And that's probably the coolest thing about it. So just to give you an example of the kind of applications that you can write in native client, 
Um, you probably saw this if, you've, uh, if you went to the keynote, but the uh, Unity game, Lego Star Wars. This was a project that we got the opportunity to port uh, about five weeks ago. And it was about four weeks of effort by a team of about four guys. Not only porting the game and the runtime engine, but also the mono compiler and runtime. They're doing all of that, porting it to native client with four guys in four weeks. So you can see that this isn't a really super difficult thing to do. So let's look at why this uh, is getting easier all the time, the native client SDK. If you download the native client SDK, you're gonna find a tool chain that looks very familiar if you've worked with Linux or Mac or Sigwin. It's a standard new tool chain, has all the libraries you'd expect, and it has something called Pepper. A Pepper is a platform independent multimedia API and implementation of NP API. So what this means is, if you've ever written an NP API plugin, you know you've always gotta do a little bit of fiddling and some if defs here and there to sort of paper over the differences between platforms. Pepper gets rid of those differences and adds audio, video, and OpenGL ES, and the ability to talk directly to JavaScript. So you can be writing C or C++ or Python or Ruby or Go or any language that you want as long as it has a compiler for NACL. And you can talk to the JavaScript, the HTML DOM, and the audio and video and OpenGL that we provide through Pepper in your native client executable. And there's also some sample code and some scripts and some things that'll hopefully make your life a little easier. As I mentioned, if you want to use the SDK, if you've used the GNU toolchain before, things will look very familiar to you. Should be able to get off the ground very quickly. One little quirk is that you do need to run in a web browser, which means that you need to have a web server. So we actually bundle one of those with the native client SDK. We've got a little Python HTTPD that you can run. And our debugging story, quite honestly, is not fully baked. But at this point, you can debug with GDB, and we'll talk a little bit later about our upcoming plans for more debugging support. All right, so now we've talked about what NACL is and a little bit about how we've tried to make it easier to program. Now here's David Springer is gonna show you how you can use the NACL SDK to turbocharge a web app with native client. All right, thanks, Ian. Um, my plan is to write a little application in front of you. So this demo could be really, really short, because uh, all this stuff is really new. So hang on to your pocket protectors, here we go. Uh, let me talk about a NACL web application a little bit the, uh, first, how this thing gets set up. Uh, a lot of you probably know about the model view controller kind of design pattern. This is very, very similar. So you really are building a web application, right? Uh, and we're going to add this kind of C++ back end to it. So this is a web application we're gonna to attempt to build here is this little calculator. This is obviously very contrived. Uh, you wouldn't normally just do a calculator with C++ code, but uh, the idea is to kind of get you, to show you how this all works together. So under the hood of this, there are base, these basic parts. Um, the first one is, of course, the JavaScript. So that's where all your user interface and a lot of your, that kind of uh, model and controller logic sits, right? And in, in your markup, in your, your CSS, et cetera. And in our world, in the native client web app world, that talks through an interop bridge, which we call Pepper. So back to the salt, uh, bad puns, we have salt and pepper. <laughs> Okay, uh, anyway, so, so that's the interop bridge and that's the, kind of, that's the stuff that uh, glues the JavaScript to the C++. And 
that then speaks through this sandbox layer that Ian talked about earlier. So we don't want your C++ code getting out of this sandbox. And you're, through our validators and stuff like that, you're not allowed to do that. And then your actual C++ module, which we call Nexi's native client executables, of course, they sit inside that sandbox. So let's, let's do this. Um, First thing you have to do if you're going to write a web app with native client is get an SDK and install it. Okay? It's a normal step in everything, but there is an SDK that you get. Uh, there, there's URLs at the end of the talk of where to go to get all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm going to organize this tutorial in three parts, which kind of reflect the three basic pieces of the architecture. There's the application, which is all done in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So it's primarily a web app. That's what we're writing here. And if you were in the talk previous to this one, which is the Chrome developer tools, you saw that we have all these uh, amazing developer tools to help you build web apps, debug the JavaScript, and so on and so forth. So you can use all those properties to build that, the application section of, of your web app. The uh, second piece is the NACL module itself, which is the C++. And that's where I'm going to build all the kind of the meat of the computation engine, if you will. This computation engine in this example is really, really tiny. But you can imagine larger ones. And then the third piece is this experimental object layer that we're building, which handles all the interop, and we're calling it sea salt, just to continue the bad puns. And the idea of sea salt is that it uh, simplifies the interop between the JavaScript and your C++ code. So that's, that's kind of what we're actively working on. Uh, I lead a team out in Boulder, beautiful Boulder, Colorado, uh, that is building this SDK right now. Um, OK, let's start with the, the UI stuff. So now we're going to actually program the application. Uh, this is HTML and CSS. It's absolutely stuff you've all seen, right? There's nothing really magical about it, except for the magical parts of HTML. So, you know, we've got a div uh, with the calculator. We've got uh, this little form that's going to show the result and buttons. And um, this is the CSS behind the button. You know, nothing amazingly special there. And what I'm going to do also in this part of the application is add some functional stuff. So when you click the equals button, it'll call this start calculate. So I just wire up start calculate to the on click. And here's the JavaScript now to do that. So uh, again, all, all very straightforward web application programming, right? A uh, couple things to point out in this function are that the calculated way I've kind of architected this, if you can call it that, is, is that the calculator gives you, a, you type in an infix notation expression, and then I'm going to turn it into a postfix, and then feed that into a calculator object to produce a result, evaluate the postfix. Well, the infix to postfix conversion is actually a lot of string processing, which is way easier for me to do in JavaScript than C++. So I actually just coded all that in JavaScript. The point being that when you're writing these web apps, write in the language and in the environment that makes most sense to you. If it makes a lot of sense to you to do this kind of conversion in C++, then it's fine to do it there too. It's just, this is just how I happened to do it because it was easier for me. Uh, other thing to point out is that the Nexi module that we're gonna build in the next stage of this just looks like a JavaScript object. According to the JavaScript, it's just another object. It's, there's nothing special about it or anything really special that you have to do. Uh, and you can see here that it, it just, it's, it's an object and it has a, this calculate method. The calculate method on that object gets two parameters. It gets the postfix expression as an array, of course. And then it also takes a closure object. So the idea is that I've built this so that the calculator figures out the answer and then calls the closure with the result. And, and there's that binding. So again, very straightforward JavaScript stuff. If you're familiar with JavaScript, this is going to be nothing new to you. Uh, OK, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, 
I have everything live here, so hopefully this works. Uh, first thing I want to do is point out that this is a web app, right? So I have to start this little local server, and I'm going to do that right now. Um, so uh, here we go with our little local server, and um, that comes with the SDK. If you have your own web server that you normally publish to, you can put your Nexies there. It doesn't matter. This is just something that make, make my life a little easier. So the other thing I want to point out is that I am using uh, the IDE I'm most comfortable with. I happen to write a lot of stuff in Xcode because I worked at Apple for a long time. So uh, I built this whole application inside of Xcode, which you can do. It's, it's, it's and I've hooked this all up so that I should be able to just say build and run, and it will uh, hopefully launch Chrome with the calculator. So there it is, all right? Again, no, I don't have any Nexi yet. So this is all just HTML, CSS, JavaScript. It's, it's a pure web app at this point with no native client module yet. And here's what it does. We can click buttons, and hopefully you can see that so I can say, you know, eight plus three, and it's doing things. And then when I hit equals, uh, of course, there is no Nexi. So I wrapped all that inside of a try catch block, and because the calculator object doesn't exist, it hits the catch clause, which just says, oh, the answer must be 42, because that's the answer to everything. So, all right. Okay, so that was step one. Um, Moving on to step two, let's build out the Nexi now. So now I'm going to add some C++ code and actually make this do a little bit more. Uh, here is some C++ code, right? To those of you who have written C++, this should look fairly familiar. And what we do with the C salt, again, this is the experimental uh, object layer, is that we say, okay, you're building a module. So in C++, we create this module. And part of that initialization process is the C salt layer asks you what methods does your object, your, your module have? And so it calls this initialized methods uh, uh, method on your object. And what we're going to do is bind it to the calculate C++ method. Okay, so the idea is that we have this calculate method in JavaScript that is going to eventually flow into this calculate method in C++. And how that works is that um, we uh, make the little binder thing and then say add method name calculate. And then that goes out into the JavaScript. And this is what it looks like in JavaScript. So no surprises, right? So JavaScript calculate. And the Seesaw bridging layer works through Pepper and through the sandbox and all that stuff to make this JavaScript call eventually go into the C++. OK, so back in the C++ now, uh, we'll continue with what happens. Uh, we're going to write little pepper stuff. And so now I'm filling out the actual calculate method. And you can see here, the first thing I do is grab that array. So there's uh, the expression array is create array from NP variant. This is just some, that's just pepper stuff. And so, you know, like I say, the C salt thing is very experimental. So we're still working out all the details of this. But then what I do is I say, all right, call evaluate expression, which is my C++. It's the guts of my C++ stuff. And give me a double result. And here's what the evaluate expression like. It's a really, really simple post fix. It doesn't even work that well. Uh, but it, you know, it's, it's a demo. And uh, then it produces a result. Now we're going to write a little bit more pepper stuff to push that result back over the bridge and call that closure object. So that's what this in right below that if statement, all that if clause is, you can see it's pulling out the result, turning it into a, a thing that's digestible by JavaScript. And then it just says uh, this invoke default, which is the way from within your Nexi to call back out to the uh, JavaScript function. And uh, now back into the JavaScript, here's what that looks like. This closure will get called with the double result. OK, so let's see what that looks like. And uh, I had such good luck with the first run. Maybe the second one will work, too. Uh, 
So let me go to calculator two. Again, Xcode project. Uh, one thing I do want to point out here is that um, what I did was, on, in Xcode you can glue a custom executable to it, which I just made Chromium. But one of the things I, that, uh, and this is all explained in the SDK, SDK documents, is that you have to add this dash dash enable knackle flag when you're gonna do native client modules. Because we, we are still kind of experimental, uh, we are behind a flag. Last year we were kind of a research project. This year we're becoming a real product. So this is you know, getting the full force of, of Google behind it. Uh, okay, so I should be able to build and run this. Now we have basically the same thing. It's gonna look a lot the same as what you just saw because the whole basic, the whole web app was already written in the markup, and uh, one of the first things that you notice is different is that it says, oh, I loaded the calculator module. So that because the Nexi actually exists now. So it says, oh, you know, I found it, and, and I just have a little alert in there that, that lets me know that and lets me know that my demo's actually working. So if I say, you know, seven plus uh, six, right, equals 13. So now it's actually doing the computation through the C++. So, so that's all now glued together. Okay, thank you. Okay, one more step. Uh, let's do more with Pepper and the kind of the fun stuff you can do in there in the C++ code. So we're gonna go back to C++ again and uh, we'll add sound. So step one of adding sound is uh, I'm going to expose this click method. So again, as I explained before, where you can say, okay, add methods, you know, C salt says, what are your methods? I'm gonna expose one called click and wire it up to calculator click. And then I'm also going to expose a property on the object too. So, you know, in JavaScript, you can have these functions which are really just also properties and, and scalar properties. So uh, here C salt is saying, what are your properties? And I say, okay, I'm going to make an accessor for my property and a mutator because I can get it and set it. And then I'm going to add this property named button sound wired up to the accessor and, and mutator there. And so over in the JavaScript, here's what that looks like. There's the click method getting called. Okay, so we already went through that with the, uh, the calculate. And here's setting the property button sound. It just looks like JavaScript. There's, there's nothing special about it, right? It's uh, all should be all very familiar. Okay, so back into the C++ code now, uh, there's a little bit more work that we have to do, which is some kind of pepper stuff. And that is actually implement the accessor and the mutator. So here's the accessor, get button sound. And you see all it's doing is it's just taking an internal variable inside my object that play button sound and sticking it into a, a variable that can be digested by JavaScript. And here's the mutator. So I'm grabbing that variable and using sea salt to do all the variable marshalling because as you know, JavaScript variables can be just about anything. They don't, there's no strong typing, uh, which is kind of a, a really difficult thing for C++ programmers to get their head around sometimes. But the idea is that uh, we get this thing from JavaScript and CSALT says, okay, I'm gonna figure out what it is and then return the most appropriate Boolean value. If it already is a Boolean, it's just what you get. But if it's a string or if it's a double or an int or whatever else, you kind of do some attempts to make a Boolean value out of that and set it. So that's what this is doing. Now let's add the actual audio. So that was the kind of the setup for it. And here's the part where we're gonna really set the audio. When your module actually gets loaded and then all the devices are ready for use. So there's 2D devices, 3D devices. These are all in the SDK examples and there's audio. Uh, you get this call, this set window call, which says, okay, now you're live in the browser. The devices are ready. You can go to town, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, all right, I wanna create an audio device. So I just simply ask Pepper. I say, I want a Pepper audio device. And then I configure it. And you see there's a whole bunch of stuff in there to configure the, the sound sample type and everything else. And then I have this callback that I give it, which we'll look at a little bit later. And what's happening is that a thread gets started in your native client module that plays the sound. And that thread continuously calls this callback saying, I want more samples for the buffer to play. Um, 
then I just simply say initialize the context, I'm ready to go. So now I have an audio context in there. And here's what that audio con callback looks like. It's really just a very, very thin wrapper on top of the synthesized button click method inside my object. Okay. So here is the synthesized button click method in the object. Very, very simple. All it's doing is copying samples from the button click sample uh, into the play buffers. I have a little click pending piece of state in there to tell me whether the click has finished playing or not because Pepper's output buffers are, can be smaller than the wave sample that I originally have, right? I mean, wave samples can be very large and the Pepper buffers are, are generally a K or, or so. So, you know, it's just, that, that's all that is. It's really, really simple stuff. Okay, so let's see what that looks like. And back to here, uh, let me minimize two, I have three. Um, I should just be able to say build and run. And so by the way, that build and run step, what it's doing is it's running all the native client compilers and producing, producing validated code and writing out a Nexi for me, which I then load in via, via my page. Uh, okay, it got it. So now let's see if this works. Sound. All right. Okay, that's it. We did it. Back to Ian. All right, thanks, Dave. So we're still hard at work at this stuff. Uh, I wanted to let you know a little bit about what we're working on. The first thing that uh, is actually my team doing this uh, is full support for debugging, not just GDB, but also Visual Studio. So that's been a party and a half getting, to, getting that to work. Um, if you have any questions about that, you can ask me. <laughs> uh, we're also doing plugins uh, to support all the popular integrated development environments. So you'd be able to develop NACL code just as easily as you develop any other kind of code. We're working on this interop library, the CSALT library that Dave showed you. We'd like to make that much more easy to use so that it feels more natural, like you're just uh, programming in your native language instead of having to do a lot of marshalling back and forth between Pepper and JavaScript. And finally, probably the most exciting thing we're working on is something called Portable Knackle, which we pronounce Pinnacle. Now, Portable Knackle is an LLVM-based bytecode representation of your native code. So what that gives you is the ability to have a portable representation that can then be downloaded uh, in, and compiled on the client to match the, the client's uh, architecture. Or you could compile it on the server to match a client's architecture. So that's interesting to us because at this point, Although NACL is completely cross-platform with regards to operating system, it does still need to be compiled for 32-bit Intel and 64-bit Intel and ARM as separate Nexes. And what Pinnacle allows us to do is have one Nexi that's completely portable, and we think that's what the web is all about. If this uh, interests you as much as it interests us, we'd love to have your contributions and your comments like to hear about your problems or your triumphs with this software. Uh, so you can go to nativeclient.googlecode.com. You can get the SDK at nativeclient-sdk.googlecode.com. And if you have anything at all to say about it, please visit our Native Client Discuss Google group. If you'd like to see more demos, we're going to have a ton of them at our booth in the developer sandbox which is just right around the corner underneath the big chrome balloon, and Dave and I will be there all afternoon, and we'll have uh, people from the native client team there all day tomorrow as well. So come see us there. Now, to finish up, before you take questions, we actually have a special guest, uh, our developer from the Unity team, Jonas, has uh, been able to sneak in uh, under the nose of the fire marshal, I guess, and. Uh, he's here to talk a little bit about the Unity experience on Native Client. So, Jonas. Uh, microphone. 
So, uh, hello, my name is Jonas Echterhoff. I'm working for Unity Technologies. Uh, we're developing the Unity game engine, which is the technology driving the Star Wars game you saw before. So, um, I want to give you a brief demo of uh, how Unity works, what it is about, and then talk about our motivation for porting it to native client and uh, my experience uh, in getting the port to work. Now, it seems we have a little problem with the display connector here. I'm just going to plug out this one and try if that works. Yeah, it, it did something here. It should. There we are. There we are. Great. So, um, what you're seeing here is the, the Unity editor, which is the um, tool people use to develop content. So, Unity is an engine people use to develop games or any other kind of interactive 3D content. Um, People are using it for other kind of kinds of projects, actually, like architectural visualization or scientific stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm going to show you, like, give you a brief overflow of uh, some workflows. Uh, so what you see here is the scene view. Um, anybody who is using 3D modeling tools uh, should be familiar with the look and feel of it, like. Um, So you can move around your scene, uh, which is typically a level in a game. You can click on anything, and then it will show up here in the hierarchy, which is a list of all objects in the scene. And you can edit its properties here in the in the inspector. Um, like some some objects may have scripts attached to it, which can be written in C sharp or JavaScript to define behaviors, which is uh, where you would set up your gameplay. So um, down here you have the game view, which is where you can actually try out what you're working on. So anytime you can just hit the play button, and then uh, you can test your game in here. So let me just expand that. Yeah, we don't have audio now because we're using the different uh, connector. But yeah, this this isn't much of a game really. I just I just took the scene because it looks so nice. Um, but yeah, one thing we care a lot about is when people develop content like this, they want very fast iteration times to try out ideas. Like with traditional game engines, people might uh, decide the test their game, then decide they they're not quite happy with the look of something, and then like re-export it in their modeling tool or texture, then make a new build of the game and start over and testing. So I'll show you how you, how you do it in Unity. So uh, say we don't like the look of the zebra crossing. We just go to the scene view, find it here. There we have it, so we pick it up here in the inspector. Here's our uh, texture, so down this, this is the asset view, which contains all the assets making the pro uh, project. So um, we just open this texture file up in Photoshop, do some changes to it. Like, I think this looks nicer, so I just save it. And uh, the moment you save it, the editor detects that the file has been changed on disk and automatically re-imports it. So now you can see the texture has changed here in the game. I can, hit, uh, I can resume testing right where I uh, stopped and resume playing. 
So I, I w we think this is a very fast process to develop content, and it works for any kind of assets. You can you can do the same thing with your 3D models uh, and anything you're using. So uh, you can you can always test uh, your game exactly how it would look in the editor. But uh, once you want to try it on your actual build platform, you can make a build here. So as you see, we support lots of different platforms. We support uh, common game consoles. We have support for Android, which is new for us. So uh, there's a, we have a small boost at the developer sandbox where we showcase that in case you're interested. We support iPhone uh, standalones for Mac and PC, and we have a web player. So the web player allows you to embed Unity content in, uh, in web pages for rich interactive experiences. People are using it like for having games embedded in Facebook pages. Um, so, so far we implemented this using a custom plugin. Well, it works pretty well for us, and uh, lots of people are installing it. We have 30 million installs. That is actually a very insignificant uh, percentage of the internet population. So what we really like is to be able to have people run our content without installing a plugin first. And that's why we're really excited about Native Client. So Native Client uh, will allow us to run on uh, Chrome browsers, uh, Chrome OS, and hopefully at some point other browsers will adapt it as well without any, any hurdles for the users. So right now it runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. This is very cool for us, actually, because we never had a Linux plugin. We're always too afraid of uh, having various different um, distributions and driver issues. Now we have the problem taken away from us by Google, which is nice for us. And uh, I guess they can take the pain. Um, so yeah, we just decided to, to port to native client very recently. I heard about it first a month ago, so uh, on very short notice I got on a plane to Mountain View to work uh, alongside Google engineers to get this running, for, for to have a demo for the conference. Um, yeah, let me tell you how it worked for us. So getting, getting our code com to compile in NACL GCC uh, wasn't a big problem. We were already using POSIX APIs since we were running on the Mac and other platforms which use them. Um, I mean, some things we can't do, which we're normally doing in the web plugin. We, we don't have file access, which we're using for permanent storage. storage. We don't have network sockets. I believe there are plans to expose some functionality uh, in the Pepper APIs to, to have this. But yeah, and in the Pepper APIs, which we have to use for all hardware and browser interactions, so we had to port all our code to use that. that like input was very straightforward. Audio wasn't a big problem since FMOD, the audio library we use, is just ha it has the ability to mix down um, all this 3D positional audio into sample buffers, which we can just then give to the Pepper API, as David just showed you. Graphics was a bit more difficult for us because it uses OpenGL ES 2.0, which can do pretty much everything you want to do with normal OpenGL, but it only has a subset of the functions you have, so you have to implement some things differently. Like all the rendering is done using shaders, so um, we'd had, we had to write some code to convert like non-shader rendering code, which like using the normal vertex lit pipeline, to dynamically generate shaders for us. This is, we had to do this because we want to support all our content which is deployed for other platforms as well. Uh, luckily, some of that work was already done because we are targeting OpenGLES on uh, Android and other platforms too. So for us, by far the most difficult part was getting the mono runtime to work, which we're using for scripting. So people, people write code in C-sharp and JavaScript. This is where we got help from Google. Like uh, thanks to Brad and Nicholas and Elijah, without them this wouldn't be possible. They were working on this. They got the uh, mono compilers to actually output native client compilant machine code um, from the C sharp code, which is great. So uh, yeah, I mean overall, I'm very happy with the results. There were some rough edges. I would certainly have liked better debugging tools. We did a lot of printf debugging. But I mean, this is a this is a product which is in very active development, so this should become much better. So I, I encourage anybody who's interested to download the NACL SDK and just try it out. And or if that sounds too complex for you, or if you want to uh, target other platforms, you might want to give Unity a chance. You can download a free version from our website, unity3d.com. 
So yeah, that's it from me. If you have any questions, I'll be around for a while. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I think we do have a little bit of time for questions. I know that some of you probably have other uh, sessions to get to, so we won't feel too bad if you walk out. But uh, Dave and I, uh, or Jonas, uh, can take questions right now if, if there are any. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Do you know when the flag will be unnecessary? Uh, on the Chrome browser, will, when will you no longer need to pass the flag? Do we have a definitive response for that? Chrome 6. That, that's, <laughs> we're, we're shooting for Chrome 6 on that. Yeah. The, oh, the question was, when do we get to turn the flag off? And the answer is Chrome 6 at this point. Um, we, we are trying to synchronize with Chrome releases. Um, I don't think that we've issued any guarantees, so. Uh, the other question is, um, it sounds like you did a lot of work to port uh, Mono over. Is that work going to be contributed back to open source, or is there going to be any way to get at that, that code? I believe that's open source. Uh, yes, uh, for merging that code back to the uh, open source repository is not done yet because it's still very rough and needs to be cleaning up. But it's definitely the plan to, to get those changes back. Yeah. So the question was if, if we're going to port Mono and, uh, or if we're going to contribute the Mono port back. Um, now, the, the mono port is just a 32-bit, so we still need to do the 64-bit port, but the idea is to um, go ahead and, and get all that done. Any other questions? Okay, like I said, we'll be at the uh, developer sandbox all day, so if you have uh, anything else you want to say to us or ask us, please stop by. Thanks a lot. <laughs>